Hello, everybody. I'm Phil Brandt, President and CEO of the AIM Employers Association, and welcome to This Week at Work. This Week at Work is the only show about the workplace that offers you front row seats and a microphone featuring experts in human resources and employment law to bring you practical, timely, and accurate insights so you can more effectively lead your organization. It's Thursday, November 30th, episode 258. Today, we focus on what it takes to get out ahead in the ever-evolving payroll tax and fringe benefits landscape. A landscape where retaining talent isn't just a process, it's an art. And we're happy to be joined by Amanda Dusselt, a CPA, instructor, and master artist who paints by numbers on a calculator's paper roll canvas. Plus, we save time for our lawyer on the clock. And we welcome your questions. All this and more on This Week at Work. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your friends and family over the holiday. I know I did. Probably put on a few extra pounds, as I always do during the holiday season. Kicks off with Thanksgiving. Bert, how about you? Did you get some time to relax after your big Supreme Court victory? Yeah, Phil, you're talking about Thanksgiving. Wasn't that months ago? Oh, wait a minute. Oh. That was only a week ago. Wow. It feels like uh, feels like forever ago. But no, Bert, uh, just one month, uh, one week ago today. I, I, I did enjoy my uh, Thanksgiving, but that was really in large part to the fact that uh, a case that uh, I was supposed to be going to trial in uh, on this uh, coming Monday, December 4th, uh, settled on the Wednesday late evening of thanks right before Thanksgiving. So I'm going to interpret that, Bert, as you had them leveraged maybe in a headlock and they were like, you know what, we just better settle with this guy who's going to crush us. Maybe something like that, Phil. I don't know. I wouldn't go too far on that. <laughs> well, that's what we'll, I'll go ahead and believe that anyway. But we're definitely certain uh, or certainly thankful that everyone uh, is able to join us today from across the country. And for those of you who did do some binge watching, I know you're out there of some of the episodes. Thank you for that as well. Um, I do know a lot of our listeners like to uh, just take some time and they'll watch several episodes at a time. Um, but Bert, let's not let ourselves get too far ahead of us. Netflix still will out outperform us in the ratings. Um, we will get to uh, Amanda here in a little bit. She and I had a great discussion. We're going to play that for you. But before we do that, let me introduce the poll questions. All right, here are the two questions. Uh, Nick, I, again, I, you do a great job producing these questions. Uh, I really like um, the second question or the first question here. Uh, with the numbers crunching side of the business, either being a strength or weakness for some, and either joyful or dreadful for others. We want to know what one word comes to mind to describe how you feel when someone mentions accounting. Now, Nick, this would have been a great question if you would have said, if someone mentions legal, maybe that could be our question next week. Ooh, I um, like that. But, well, but in this case, we're going to go with accounting. Um, and, and then if we want to have some fun with it we can say hr as well and see which one scores better legal or hr we'll have a little competition but this week we want to know what's the one word when someone describes and uh what how it, how you feel when someone mentions accounting the second question is which of the following methods does your hr team use to communicate payroll tax fringe benefits those types of things to employees and that being uh, handbooks, uh, email communications, payroll, our employee portal, all hands meetings, and so on. There's lots of uh, options. Nick, is this select all that apply or uh, yeah, select yes. one? Yep, select all that apply. And actually, we want to hear if there's one that's not on the list because, you know, we ran out of room. But uh, right. if, if the, we want to hear if there's something that's not on there. So comment. Oh, yeah, for sure. We'd love to get your comments. If you have any great Thanksgiving uh, stories or thankful uh, references that you would like to put into the comments, let us know. We'll try and get to those as well. But Bert, if you're ready, I'm ready for some lawyer on the clock. I, I, I'm sure our audience is waiting with uh, bated breath, Phil. Hey, that's why they signed up. It wasn't It wasn't for this. It wasn't for this, Bert. <laughs> All right. Hey, you know, also, what are we both doing here with white shirts today? What is that about? 
I, I, white shirt Wednesday, but it's Thursday. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. All right. We're also all, all right, slowly Nick. getting the same haircut. It's strange. <laughs> uh, well, that's a, that's a sign of age. Um, Nick, let's go ahead and pull that lever. All right. It's time to look into what's trending in employment law. Lawyer, you're on the clock. All right. So when we last had uh, my my colleague Tom Chibnall on the program, uh, it was very fortuitous because he was on, I think, the same week that OSHA and the National Labor Relations Board had published their Memorandum of Understanding, which is designed to facilitate interagency cooperation and strengthen the agency's partnership to promote safe and healthy workplaces. This was on uh, literally uh, a month ago when OSHA and the NLRB signed this memorandum of understanding. Uh, it's not uncommon for federal agencies to generally work together when appropriate circumstances arise, but these MOUs that the agencies have been signing recently really outline specific means and methods for the agencies to cooperate and coordinate their efforts to, as they say, protect employees uh, or we might say on our side to come in and investigate the employers. And so while OSHA and the NLRB have historically engaged in cooperative efforts and have entered into prior MOUs, this 2023 memorandum of understanding from October 30, 2023, right before Halloween, expanded that cooperation and really strengthened the efforts of the agency's partnership to promote safe and healthy workplaces through protecting worker voice. That's what they said there. And so right. this new MOU provides through for protecting outreach. worker's voice. Yep. That's an interesting phrase to me. It is. Yeah. I agree. This, mem this MOU provides for outreach that uh, would explain federal anti-retaliation protections, cross-training of staff at each agency, broader interagency communication and information sharing and coordinated investigations and enforcement uh, of the respective laws. So uh, I, I think employers really need to be uh, paying attention to this. Employers really should be preparing to handle inspections that implicate both the NLRB and OSHA regulations, and they need to cross-train their appropriate management on the relevant aspects of the OSHA Act and the National Labor Relations Act, particularly as they relate to anti-retaliation provisions contained in both of those acts. Now, really significantly, Phil, in the event uh, that there's a, uh, <clears throat> under, under this new memorandum of understanding, the agencies are trying to advocate that when there is an OSHA inspection, that a representative of the union should be allowed to accompany uh, OSHA in its walk around of the facility. And so that represents something very significant here. It's really designed to empower the unions and to sort of make them uh, have a little bit of third party oversight. Bert, let's just hold on for a minute. So uh, are you make, obviously they would have that right if they were already a unionized facility. Well, so are you referring to if this is a non-represented facility, they may still have the ability to invite OSHA in to represent them as a group of employees, or not OSHA, well, but the union. Yeah, not, I need some clarity where you're going with that. Sure, yeah. not necessarily. So what they would have in a non-union facility is they would have the right to have a third party accompany the OSHA inspector on the inspection. And that and could so, be a union representative. Exactly, could, could be a union representative. But even now, uh, or historically, when OSHA shows up, the union representative, somebody from the union does not really have a right to accompany OSHA on the walk around inspection. And okay. so what they're trying to say is, is that now somebody who's a third party, even from a union might be able to come in and accompany uh, the OSHA inspector on the inspection uh, along with the employer's representative. So we want to be careful about that. We want to make sure that employers are prepared to deal with that because, again, you don't want a uh, OSHA inspection to turn into a union organizing campaign. Right. That, I okay. think that's where I was going. If it's if it's not already organized, then this adds a layer of complication to it. It does, for sure. Yeah. 
The next one I want to chat about, and we'll just do this one really quickly, is uh, so just... Bert, I just before you move on, um, let's sure. just stay with that. I think this brings up the importance that if OSHA shows up at our door following the protocols um, that you should have predetermined, um, and we want to add to those protocols what to do if these requests are made. Exactly. Right? I mean, that's... Obviously, when I was a safety professional and, and if I had OSHA show up at the door, I had a list of protocols and how we would um, manage the visit, if you will. Um, and that may or may not include uh, contact in our legal representative, but maybe more so than ever now, that might be important, particularly if there's going to be a request for a third party accompaniment to this. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right, Phil. All right, so the next one I want to chat about real quickly is uh, just uh, something that happened uh, a couple days ago, and that is that uh, the Senate rejected President Biden's Department of Labor training arm pick after a long wait. So uh, somebody named Jose Rodriguez, who had been nominated back in July of 2021, uh, he, he was nominated to head up the Employment and Training Administration which is the largest Department of Labor uh, sub-agency. It controls roughly three quarters of the Department of Labor's total appropriations. Uh, Senator Joe Manchin, a Democrat from West Virginia, who we've talked about many times on the program, and Bob Menendez, a Democrat from New Jersey, voted against Ro uh, Rodriguez. Uh, due to other folks who weren't there to vote, the chamber voted 44 to 51. Uh, to uh, not advance him for a final confirmation vote. Uh, and so typically nominees only go to the floor if they have the necessary votes to clear the procedural hurdle to end the debate in the nomination. That's not always the ending result. Biden's first wage and hour administrator pick, David Wheel, also failed at this stage in the process in 2022. Uh, Manchin specifically said he had concerns about the nominee's political activism and lack of experience. And uh, so I think, again, this is a, a, a pretty significant blow to the uh, Department of Labor here uh, in rejecting Rodriguez. Is there, the last Bert, I'm just not familiar with, with this arm, this branch that you're referring to. What is it that they oversight and see? Well, so it's the uh, Employment and Training Administration, and again, they control roughly two-thirds of the budget. Uh, so they're really in charge of the nation's workforce development system, uh, okay. and they also oversee the federal state uh, unemployment insurance system, which, of course, came under heavy criticism for a spike in unemployment fraud during the COVID-19 pandemic. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Sure. And then the last one I want to talk about here, Phil, I know we, we, we get accused oftentimes of uh, not being supportive of unions, and I think you and I may have a little bit of a differing opinion here, but uh, I, I just want to mention that some recent uh, contracts that unions have been negotiating, and negotiating in particular uh, employment sectors, in particular out in Hollywood and or the recent casino labor deal, really show how unions are focusing on artificial intelligence in the workplace. So you've got the Las Vegas casino employees and the hot Hollywood writers and actors, and they've, their contracts that they've recently negotiated really aim to control the use of artificial intelligence in the workplace and really trying to make sure that AI does not eliminate their jobs. And I actually think that's a good space for the unions to be in, uh, trying to put some parameters on the use of AI so that the labor market has time to adjust to AI coming into the workplace and it doesn't result in uh, mass displacement of employees. Yeah, and so, see, I just, I, I feel differently. I'm like, bring on the AI, let's embrace it with, you know, arms wide open. This is, to me, there's no stopping it. I mean, the genie is already out of the bottle. And I don't know how we tell businesses you cannot or should not in a, you know, a capital system like we have, pursue cost reductions and efficient. You should not pursue cost reductions. You should not pursue efficiencies. That's, that's where I, I side from 
on well, that. Well, and I, I'm, I, I agree with you because I am a capitalist through and through, but and, and importantly, none of these agreements ban employers from using AI in the workplace, but they put up guardrails for how employers roll out the new technology and okay. set rules for how it affects workers. So the unions are, are, are focusing not just on preventing job losses, but really on how the technology might devalue workers' jobs and give employers more, uh, more power in the workplace. So by example, the Writers Guild primarily focused on controlling the use of generative AI in projects. And under their agreement that they reached uh, a month or so ago, writers can choose to use AI when working on screenplays if the company consents, but they cannot be forced to use it. And any work produced by AI is not considered quote unquote literary material under the agreement and AI is not considered to be a writer, which means human writers will still maintain rights and pay under the agreement, even if AI is involved at some stage of the process. And again, I think the significant point here is, is that they're trying to just, they're, they're trying to make sure that as AI gets phased into the workplace, that it doesn't result in mass displacement of workers and really trying to, uh, make for a more orderly and measured uh, implementation of AI in the workplace. And the casino deal that uh, was recently ratified with Wynn Resorts, MGM, and Caesars, you know, they're also trying to make sure that, uh, that, that employees, uh, when employers decide to use AI, uh, there must be six months notice before the employer uses a technology that could disrupt jobs and give workers whose jobs are replaced by technology $2,000 for every year that they were on the job. Again, they're trying to make sure that uh, there are some guardrails that are being put up. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I understand that position. I, I don't believe it's uh, the right thing for businesses, um, I, I, but I do understand the position. I'm all about protecting jobs, but I'm also, in the side that I think it will end up creating as many jobs as it displaces. Now it may not be of the same skill, the same trade, and 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 I do understand that. And I think we have to be sensitive to those things as we move along through society for sure. Yeah. All right. So we have agreement on that piece of it, Phil. Yeah. That's what I got for you today. That is good stuff from uh, Bert Garland, shareholder at Ogletree Deacons. Thank you very much for that, Bert. All right, we are going to move ahead here, Nick. Uh, can we take a look at the poll results real quick? Uh, do we have any to see? Yes, we I do. I don't know if we, so all right, let's see what here. we have here. We have the uh, the word. We have the word that comes to mind uh, when to describe how someone feels when someone mentions accounting and now, there's an excited in there. Everything's kind of equally weighted. Well, wow, we know at least we have one accountant listening to us uh, out there. I bet his name is Brian, um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see, yeah. <laughs> That's good. And, yeah. and any look? leading categories on the other side of the poll question? So there we have it. On the screen now, uh, tied for first is employee handbooks and manuals and All email right. communications. There you go. Yeah, so I'm surprised. Traditional not. there. Yeah, little all employee meetings. Those were my days, uh, standing in front of the group and uh, updating everyone and taking questions. Not Phil, easy. Phil, I thought, I thought you anymore. were you were smoke signals and carrier pigeons back in your well, day. Well, yeah. Now you're you're referring to my gray hair and in, in ah. those days, that's for sure. I'm talking about more more recent days there, Bert. All right. All right. Well, let's get on to uh, my discussion with Amanda. I'm going to ask Nick to go ahead and cue that up. We had to pre-record it due to Amanda's schedule, but it was a great conversation. We do have our payroll uh, and French benefit tax program coming up here next week. Uh, it's a 37th annual program. It's a fantastic program. There's still time for you to enroll you yourself or your payroll representative uh, so they can stay abreast of all the changes that are occurring in payroll uh, across the country. But in particular, we will focus on some of the states that we have concentrations in with Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and Florida. Nick, if you're ready, go ahead and queue up Amanda, and we will see the group back here next Thursday.
All right. Thank you for joining us, Amanda. Uh, for all of our guests today, we're with Amanda Dusold. Amanda is getting ready to kick off our second annual um, payroll tax update with AIM. Uh, I think we've done 35 of these, uh, if I'm, I'm somewhere in that, over the last 35 years. But uh, this is Amanda's second uh, time with us, backed by popular demand. Uh, and, and this year, we're going to have a little different program. One, we're going to do one program in person in the Peoria community. Uh, and then we're going to come back uh, and have a second program that's going to be a combined audience live in person and also simulcast. So all of our members have a chance to participate a couple of different ways. Uh, Amanda, first, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you first have going on with the Bond County CEO program, please. Sure. Thanks for having me, Hipville. Um, so I am Amanda Dusold. I am a CPA and I am an instructor here in the accounting department school business at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville. Uh, one of my side hustles is also I am the facilitator of the Bond County CEO program. So if you're not familiar with CEO program, it stands for Creating Entrepreneurial Opportunities. Uh, we have I want to say 70 maybe programs across the, the United States, uh, mostly in rural communities where they take high school students and they get them out of the classroom and they put them in communities, in businesses. They get away from the sit and get um, education and they learn about business. Um, they create their own a class business the first semester and then they create their own individual businesses the second semester. So that is pretty much um, that's that's what the CEO program stands for. That is awesome. I know our employers uh, can appreciate that. And pre pre program, there was a little conversation just around getting that practical work experience and and getting a chance to work at that level versus um, maybe at the level that they get uh, interaction in the high school classroom. So fantastic. Approximately how many kids enroll in this program each year? So my program um, has two high schools that feed into it. And we have currently 15 students in our class or in our in our program. Um, a couple of the other like Edwardsville, Clinton County. So like the other local counties, about 20, 25 students, because you, you can have four or five high schools pulling into one program. Um, and then there are some programs that are smaller. So. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that somebody like yourself is doing that. Um, I got a chance to listen to the presentation last year on the payroll tax, and you got a world of insight. I know this is what you do at the university and, and help businesses do this as well as on the side. Uh, if I remember correctly, you also have kind of a side gig doing uh, payroll and, and those types of things as well. Am I correct? Yes, that was, I would like to say, um, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> I had my own accounting firm and I had, I was a payroll processor for several years. Um, when I got out of that business and started teaching, my husband took over the firm and went, took it in a different way. But yes, um, accounting, taxation, payroll, all, all right. of those interesting topics. I guess the reason I bring that up is fantastic because you're not just a classroom theorist. You've no. actually practiced this. You understand what it's like. Yes. If we're saying, hey, we want to give all of our employees a $25 gas card because fuel prices are high. What do we do with that from a taxation standpoint? Right. Um, and I would tell you to throw it on their practical side of things you've done. Yes. Throw it on their paycheck because it's a taxable infringement. But yes, exactly. All right. I've been great. in the weeds. <laughs> All right, so that's exactly what we like. So let's just uh, give some highlights of what we might be talking about uh, during the payroll tax update that's coming up. Is it December? I'm looking here. And by the way, I'll make a correction. It's the 37th annual payroll tax. I think I said 35 years. Um, let's see. I'm it's looking for a date. Oh, I, I think hear. it's the uh, 6th and 7th or the 7th. And it 8th. is. Yep. December 6th is in Peoria uh, and December 7th will be in St. Louis. So um, tell us first, let's break it into two segments, things that we might talk about from a federal standpoint, and then we'll break it into some of the highlights of some state changes. So federally, um, payroll tax doesn't really change year over year. Um, we are doing a higher level, or not, I'm sorry, a deeper dive into some of the fringe benefits based on the conversations that we had last year, you know, making sure to your point, if I pay a gas card or give a gas card, what is taxable, what is not. But federally, the hot topics that I'm seeing are the Secure 2.0 Act, which has to do with retirement plans, 
Um, there is a new e-filing requirement um, that's effective into 2024 as far as it used to be 250 W-2s. Now it's down to 10 W-2s and 1099s together. Uh, so the IRS has a new um, portal for that to help us with 1099s. Um, this white collar threshold is some, some things on the horizon that are still being talked about, um, whether or not we're going to increase that threshold to what's considered exempt employees for white collar um, types of, uh, of uh, professions. Um, and then this always comes up pre or post COVID. It would happen pre COVID as well, but remote workers and multi state taxation. Um, that's still on the horizon. The other things just to be familiar with as for employee benefit or for employee purposes, like maybe your employees might be asking about um, is earned wage access. And that's the basically pay as you go. I don't want to say okay. daily payroll, but that that's something that's definitely um, some companies are starting to um, offer. And then the gig economy, just being aware that you are going to have employees who have side hustles like myself and yeah. the taxations related to that. Yeah, I uh, so I do hear from our members more and more about uh, employees in different states, right, that are working remotely um, and where they are assigned to which home office and, yes. and all kinds of challenges that come with that. So I'm really happy to hear that's going to be part of the conversation uh, by design. Um, it, and is that does that matter? Because this is a question I get where the employee is assigned, if they're working for an example in the state of Illinois, but we have no physical business in Illinois and all of our business is in Michigan per se, um, does that make a difference on the payroll uh, side of things for remote workers? So um, business school answer, it depends. And that's of where- think... Oh, Bert's <laughs> gonna love it. Bert's gonna love it, our lawyer. It depends, yes. right? Um, certain states have reciprocity certain states have rules that say it's benefit of the employer. So if I'm working remotely because you, it benefits you. And then well, most states are, if I am physically working in Illinois, I need to physically withhold um, taxes in Illinois. And you, I have just created nexus for your company. Right. And so that's what's on the pipeline is that um, we want a federal government. We want a rule that basically tries to level the playing field, right? Like maybe a, the, a 30 day, hey, this can happen, but trying to make states be more similar because we, I mean, it's just, it's gone like wildfire with people having this now, multi-state workers. And is that, does that make a difference? And I'm just trying to give our audience a, a level of some of the conversation that we always have in these programs. Um, for somebody who, and I'm going to use an example, um, in this case, let's just say, um, let's use uh, Missouri and Illinois as an example. I live in Illinois, my office is in Missouri, but two days a week I work from home. Right. Right. But we didn't used to have that scenario as frequently as we do today. Um, so that would be considered remote work. Under right. that and definition, although I'm still in the same dry, I haven't moved away. Most of us think, oh, I moved away. Now I have to deal with it differently. But now if I have remote work right. on a traditional schedule, that's my question. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, it comes down to what the state rules are, what the state law is. Um, some states is 14 days. And you could, for example, uh, city of St. Louis, um, they withheld city taxes for all those employees who were right. um, working from home during the pandemic. And they pushed back and said, we weren't in the city. We were working from our home. So, right. yeah, it, and there is really no hardcore. This is the rule for everybody. Again, you have to do the. You have to dig into it and figure out what's going on with your um, with, with with your employee, with your states. So I think um, for cities that have and for businesses that are on boundary um, borders, Missouri, right. Illinois, Florida, Georgia, um, it could be Indy and Illinois. It's really understanding what those boundary borders requirements are. Right. Um, different from I actively go somewhere, hire someone in a different state who really works there all the time. Exactly. Or someone requests to move and works there all the time. Where now, you know, if I just work one day a week from home on a schedule in Illinois, That's I'm going right. to exceed 14 days. 
Yes. So it's understanding that complication. And I think that right there becomes the price of admission. That's just, that's a very important piece of detail for people to understand because we didn't used to deal with it quite so much. No. And I, yeah. um, talking about trying to appease your employees, trying to appeal to the younger generation workforce, you know, we had an employee who basically just said, I know I can work remotely. I'm going to move to Texas. So then well, you as the employer decide, okay, is this, an, a, you know, is this person indispensable to my organization? Am I going to be willing to create nexus in that state and, and follow those rules? So yeah, it, right. it's definitely, like I said, the, there is no guidance right now, except for everybody's different. But the fact that it should give us all a comfy, cozy feeling that there is a push for that and that right. there hopefully something coming down the pipeline. Yeah, that um I, I, I'll be happy when that happens, if that ever does happen. <laughs> uh, but I think I got the message. Let's break it down to on a state side. Is there any of the states, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Florida, those are our primary states, any of those states that are going through any changes that are worth mentioning from a state standpoint? Yeah, the main the main one is Illinois. Um, it is having a, it's the Paid Leave for All Workers Act is effective in 2024. Um, so that is requiring PTO being a accrual of a PTO up to 40 hours for all employees, even part-time. Okay. Yeah. So that one definitely is going to make a change. And one of the questions I have coming out of that frequently, and we've been doing several per programs on that, Bert and I did a, a great program, had lots of attendance is does, do I have to uh, uh, count that separately than my other time off? And from a payroll standpoint, I would assume you're going to be faced with that question. Um, do I actually need, if I offer PTO and now I have Vacation. Illinois paid time off requirements, do I have to track each one separately? Now, guess what I'm going to tell you? It depends. It depends, yes. <laughs> right? Um, uh, there, they do have um, they do have uh, some guidance on the web Illinois website about that, but basically, it, it you might be opening a can or opening yourself up if you don't. Like this might be more of a you can do that, but for best practices, you might want to track it separately. Right, and I'm assuming you're going to cover some best practices for people to consider. Yes. Absolutely. There it is. So if you would join the payroll tax coming up on December 6th and 7th, you'll get the details related to It Depends, and you'll be able to ask <laughs> questions around that as well. Amanda, thanks for being our guest on the program today. I appreciate what you do for us here at AIM, and I know our members enjoyed uh, the program that you put on last year, and I'm sure they will again this year as well. Until then, we will be back here next week at 7.30 Central Time. See you then. Bye-bye. Thank you once again for tuning in to This Week at Work. If you enjoy the show, please share it with your colleagues. Forward our invites. Share the link aimea.org forward slash this week at work or follow or subscribe wherever you get your news and entertainment like LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We're everywhere you are. And you can be part of the show. Send your questions and comments anytime to info at thisweek.work. We'll see you next week, 7.30 a.m. Central Time, when we discuss what's happening this week at work.